Hey, today we are on a uh, series called Divine Shift, which is all about the life of Jesus. And here's what's called a divine shift, because Jesus in his day, uh, in his teachings and his way of living, was oftentimes uh, really displaying a shift, a, a godly shift from the religious and cultural norm of the day. A good example is, he says, you say, hate your enemies, I say, love your enemies, you say, uh, again, culturally, it was normative to forgive someone up to three times. He says forgive them 70 times, seven times. He, he was introducing a new way of living in a, in a new kingdom, the kingdom of God, into the minds of the people. And today, I think it's a great uh, message to start on, a great passage to start the series on, because we are looking at a shift culturally Uh, where one where you were condemned for your sins. See, in the Old Testament, the Mosaic Law, which there were 613 Mosaic Laws that you had to keep, if for no other reason, can we just say thank you, Jesus, for that? Come on, somebody. Like, you don't have to keep 613 laws to have right standing with God. Uh, That because of the sacrifice of Jesus, you you, you have right standing with God. Uh, and, and because of that, if you broke a Mosaic law, one law, one, one little, little tidbit of the law, you were condemned of the whole law. You were penalized. You were punished because of it. And sometimes not just uh, the belief was e- eternal death, but also even death here and now because you broke the law. And Jesus came and he fulfilled the law through his death, burial, and resurrection that we now, through faith, in Christ can be made right with God. And if you're grateful for that, can you say amen? So he, he moved us from being condemned to now we're forgiven and free. So we're talking today about how do we walk now in that forgiveness? How do we, how, how do we live this life out and what, what Christ intended and what he introduced? Uh, but before we dive in, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. A truly a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We pray that as we open it up, you would speak to us today. Uh, Father, we just uh, posture our hearts and minds to receive from you. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. John 8, verse uh, 3. To give context of where we are in Scripture, uh, Jesus just fed the 5,000 with uh, a few fish and loaves. And uh, here are these Pharisees, these teachers of the law, these rabbis are confronting him. And they brought a woman, the Bible says, caught in adultery. Just a side note, how do you catch somebody in adultery? Come on, right? Like, you, you know you, you got some issues in your life. you like trying to catch people in adultery, right? You're peeking through windows, right? You know? Like, they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, again, um, the law of the Mosaic law, if you committed adultery, your penalty was uh, you were stoned to death. Uh, Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Here was a trap. Ready for this? Mosaic law says if you commit adultery, you are to be stoned to death. Roman law says the only people who could put you to death were Romans. So if he, would not, if he did not stone her, he's breaking Mosaic law. If he did stone her, he's breaking Roman law, I'm trying to trap him. So here he is now. The, they're trying to confront him, trying to trap him. But here's Jesus also knew the whole Mosaic law because he fulfilled the law through his death. So he also knew that actually it was against Mosaic law to actually accuse someone of breaking the law with malicious intent. So they of themselves were breaking the law In that moment. Also, mind you, it was common knowledge culturally that many of the rabbis were actually also engaging in adulterous affairs, which Jesus would have known as well, which is why we'll get to in a moment what he says. So it says, but Jesus then bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. We don't know what he was writing, but he he, he wrote on the ground. He kept on questioning him, straightened up. He said to them, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her knowing that this disqualified every single one of them. Uh, in fact, some say perhaps in the, in the dirt he was writing their sin. Uh, because it was common for rabbis to have adulterous affairs, some was even saying, was he writing the name of the women they had been with? And sort of prompting these men to realize, I am not, I am, I have sin. Jesus was the only one who had the full right per the law to condemn this woman, but yet he did not. He then stooped down and he wrote again, at this time, those who had heard began to walk, go away one at a time, the older ones first. I think the older ones had a little more wisdom to it, so I know what's about to happen. 
I don't want him to write that. Okay, I'm going to leave. <laughs> and Jesus was the only one left with the woman standing there. He then straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? One translation says, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. Then neither do I condemn you. Again, that statement in and of itself, mind-blowing. Huge shift. No condemnation. As Paul says in Romans 8, 1, for those who are in Christ Jesus. He declares, now go now and leave your life of sin. In other words, I'm setting you free from this life of sin. I'm setting you free from the penalty of sin. I'm setting you free from the shame of sin. These men were shaming her, and Jesus freed her. It's the beauty of Jesus. I want to share with you three thoughts in this uh, message of how we can walk in this forgiveness, how we can walk fully in what God has for us, this shift from condemnation to forgiveness. And here's the first one, is for us to walk in freedom. He says, neither do I condemn you. It reminds me of John 3, 16 and 17. Many of you know this scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. In other words, you have been released from the penalty of your sin. Just so you know, there is a penalty of your sin. The Bible says the wages of your sin, which I have sinned, you have sinned, we all have sinned. Because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And the Bible says the wages of your sin is death. Now here's, I want you to just understand this theologically. God does not erase the penalty of your sin. The penalty is still there. Here's the difference. You don't have to pay it because Christ did. It's like this. Have you ever been out to eat with a friend? And then you go to pay. You get your wallet to pay for the meal. And then all of a sudden they're like, he, he's like, oh, I got it. Or the waitress is like, he covered it. And you're like, oh, thank you so much. Um, and, and anybody here, you're that kind of friend, you pay for people's lunches? Come on, anybody? Let me see. Um, I'm going to tell you where I'm going to lunch after, okay? <laughs> Come on. How many of you are slow to, anybody, any of you got friends who are slow to pull their wallet out? <laughs> like the check gets there, they like, look at it like, okay. You know, <laughs> Come on, if, you're, if you are that friend, we're going to pray for you in a moment, Okay. <laughs> Some of you, some one of you feels that over here. You're like, I'm with them right now. Shoot, I married them. This is what it was. Uh, hear this. Theologically, here's what happens. There's a debt that says Jeremy Burroughs has to pay, and the debt is my death. And Jesus says, I got it covered. The penalty of your sin is you are supposed to die. Not just a natural death, but eternal death, damnation, hell. And Jesus says, I've paid for it. Aren't you grateful for Jesus? That he paid the debt that you should have paid, that I should have paid, so we could have eternal life with him. That's what he did for us. That's what he did for the world. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. So he acquits us of the penalty of our sin. Hebrews 8, 12 says this, For I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. He not only acquits us of the penalty of our sin, I love this, that Jesus, actually the Bible says in the Psalms, he actually casts our sin in the sea of forgetfulness. He literally forgets our sin. Like, like have you ever been in an argument with somebody, and that when you argue with them, they bring up the past? Right? Like, you just left the toilet seat up. But your spouse is reminding you of what you did six years ago. Come on, somebody. <laughs> right? Like, they're a toothpaste tube roller, and you're a squeezer. Come on, where are the toothpaste tube rollers? Where are you at? Come on. Where are the squeezers? Come on. You're my people. I'm a squeezer. You know? Be efficient. Just get it out. Figure it out. Why roll it? You know? And, 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 and you have an argument over that, but all of a sudden, what happened two months ago gets thrown in. They're like lob a grenade. It's like... Boom! Like, what, what, what just happened? <laughs> I forgot about that. Why didn't you? You know, like, <laughs> right? Like, like, and here's the good news. Don't you hear this? Listen, regardless of what you've done, regardless of whatever mistake you made, regardless of what line you've crossed, regardless of how big of the sin it was, even if it had legal complications, moral consequences, when you have a conversation with God, he never brings up your past. 
When you come to him and ask him to move in a situation, he doesn't say, well, Jeremy, but you didn't. Jeremy, but you did this? No, why? Because the Bible says he forgets our sin. Can can I just free somebody up this morning? Because I've I've been where you are. There is somebody in the room maybe that you, you, you in your mind keep replaying some mistakes you've made. Maybe even not just years ago, but even yesterday. Can I tell you this? When you confess it, acknowledge it, and repent of it as sin, God does not remember it anymore. So here's my question for you. Why do you still remember it? Drop it. God has dropped it. You can walk in the freedom of no longer having to carry the shame of your sin, the penalty of your sin, the judgment of your sin, because Christ took care of it on the cross. Theologian D.L. Moody says, the voice of sin is loud, but the voice of forgiveness is louder. Aren't you grateful? Galatians 5, 1, the apostle Paul, it is for freedom that Christ set us free. Stand firm then, don't yet yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Paul was speaking to a culture who were, uh, grew up in a Jewish culture who he was saying, don't, don't again fall back into the burden of the yoke of the law where you somehow have to, you feel like you have to, have to meet a certain standard to have right standing with God. You have to have a certain level of righteousness to be right with God. He says, no longer be, be in that yoke again where you feel like you're falling in and out of favor and grace with God because that's not the gospel. It also applies to sin, saying this, that like once you have been uh, coming into a relationship with Christ, he has set you free, not just from the penalty of sin, not just from the shame of your sin, but he has set you free from sin itself, that we can actually walk in freedom. Romans 6 says this, Paul writes, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were also baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. That we have been, that we are dead to sin. That Christ has set us free from sin. Here's what that means. Because of Christ, we can walk. Now listen, please hear this. Some freedom can happen immediately. But I've often found freedom is a process. Because there have been mindsets and patterns of your life that you have been building for years. And God can do things in a moment, but oftentimes his grace will work through a process. And he partners with us to walk free from that. But first you have to have in your mindset, I'm actually dead to sin. The Apostle Paul even says, I am a new creation. If you ever read the Apostle Paul's language, he was so passionate about this because the Apostle Paul's background, if you ever think to yourself, Jeremy, I have really messed up in life. Let me give you some insight into his life. He actually killed people who professed Jesus' name. So he felt this torment. In fact, many say when the Apostle Paul says, I have a thorn in my flesh, many, many scholars presume, again, we don't know, that his thorn was the torment of what he did in his past. That's why in his writings he says, the old is gone, the new has come. I believe Paul was preaching to himself that I am a new creation in Christ, that I am, I am free, who as Christ has been set free, who set free, we are free indeed. So we are free. We can walk free from old patterns of living. We can walk free from thinking less than ourselves because we are a child of God. We can walk free from being bound by constant anxiety over not measuring up because we now have a peace beyond all understanding in Christ. We can be free from comparing ourselves amongst ourselves. We can walk free from having to somehow feel like we have to work harder in order to somehow be right with God and others. We can be set free from our insecurities so we can get out of those unhealthy relational cycles we find ourselves in. We can get set free from the cycle of stress and self-medication that leads to self-destruction. We can be set free from having to live up to others' expectations. We no longer have to burden ourselves under the yoke of slavery. John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus says this to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, the truth Jesus is speaking of, we can, if we're not careful in our Western culture, we're very cognitively minded, meaning this, that we often think of, um, I'll say it this way, we, we glorify knowledge in our culture, uh, education and knowing. We love to know in our culture. 
Um, but part of our faith is there's a tension because there, there remains a mystery of our faith that we'll always have. There will be things that we don't know because you are not God and he is. But here in this moment, he says you will know the truth. Now, what he's saying is he's not saying you will understand a concept about the truth and that concept in knowledge that you can get from a book or an experience will set you free. The truth he is referring to is himself because the scripture says Jesus was the word of God made flesh. So he says, if you abide in my word, if you keep my word, you know my word, you put my word into practice, then you will know the truth. Not a head knowledge, you will know me, and it's me who will set you free. See, under the law, you, you read the law, you read the word to somehow earn your approval and right standing with God. And he's saying, no, you now know the word and stay in the word and keep the word so my spirit on the inside of you can set you free. He's the one who sets us free. By us reading the word and knowing the word, this is why it's important we gather as a church in the presence of God under the teaching of the word of God because it's the word who sets us free. I don't come before you and say, here are five steps to a better life. No, I preach the word of God. It's not Jeremy's words. It's not your word that set us free. It's his word that sets us free. Why? Because his word came in the flesh and that flesh's name was Jesus and it's Jesus Christ himself who sets us free. So when we know the word, listen, when we open the scriptures, we don't open them to, to like we do a, a science textbook to say, I want to grow in my knowledge. We say, God, I want to meet you. I want to encounter you. A concept will never set you free. Jesus Christ of Nazareth can set you free. So we walk in that freedom. We embrace that freedom that he has for us. But then we're called to bear the fruit of the Spirit. You know, Jesus addresses these men. Also on a side note, sometimes we can read this passage. Now, Jesus was the people who he was, if you would just say, you could phrase it this way, the people whom he was the, the hardest on were the religious. Um. Those he held to a, maybe at times a higher standard were, were the religious because he knew they knew better. But I want you to hear this because sometimes we can read this story and we can think, man, those rabbis, they were bad guys. But listen, hear this. Jesus not only did not condemn the woman in adultery, he also did not condemn the self-righteous rabbis. And sometimes if you're not careful, you can do what I call reverse judgment because I did this years ago because I was hurt by Christians who at times I perceived as self-righteous and they judged me for what I did or didn't do. So when I came back to Christ as an adult, if I ever got a whiff of someone who I maybe felt self-righteous, I would judge them. And then one time the Lord lovingly corrected me. He said, Jeremy, you are putting yourself in the same camp because you are judging those that you have felt judged by. And we have to understand, we have a highly judgmental culture. It, it looks differently than the, than the religious culture of that day, but it still exists in our day. One of the ways that we judge in our culture, even on the political spectrum, both left and right, is we cancel people. And listen, I'm not saying, people should be held accountable to consequences. Please hear that. But listen, under the blood of Jesus, no one is ever canceled before God. And no one should ever be canceled before the embrace of grace. If you repent of your sin, you come back. So just to be clear, we're not too far removed from this moment. We can look at it and say, how did you call out somebody for adultery? Yeah, but someone might be called out because they didn't say the right thing on Twitter. We are a highly judgmental culture. And Jesus, the ways of Jesus, is a highly grace culture. Now, he says, go and sin no more. He's not saying there's no standard. He's not saying there's no truth. But he leads with grace. Got real quiet in this church. I'll move on. I'll move on. <laughs> you know, I found it's easier to call out. Have you found this to be true? It's easier to call out somebody else's sin than address your own sin. You know, we often judge people by their actions, and we judge ourselves by our intentions. 
Like, you ever, you ever defended yourself in an argument because you actually didn't intend to hurt them? But you hurt them. So you need to repent of that, right? I do it all the time. I'll judge my intentions. But I'll look at someone's actions. <laughs> Even with my kids, it, uh, um, I remember a few weeks ago, I go into the, from the, I was in the family room, and I walk into the kitchen, and the pantry door's open, and we buy these, like, cliff, little cliff kids bars, like protein bars, but they have, like, chocolate and sugar in them, so we, we try to limit them, and all of a sudden, I see an empty box on the floor with wrappers, and as I walk in to ask who has eaten the cliff bars, one of my ch- children, they'll remain nameless, <laughs> points to the other, their sibling, and says, they ate them. Now, the person who was pointing their finger at their sibling saying they ate them were doing this with a little bit of chocolate on the <laughs> upper lip on the right side, the same chocolate found in those cliff bars. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. They ate them. But you have chocolate on your lip from the cliff bar. Yeah, I ate them too. <laughs> but aren't we susceptible to that ourselves? We can point out, oh, look, look, they're wrong. Again, we see it all across our culture, social media. It's all over the place. Like, well, we can point out other people's wrongdoing but not address it in ourselves. Jesus spoke this in Matthew 7. It was very abundant in that culture. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. That word hypocrite um, in the original Greek, it literally means actor or two-faced. Like you say one thing, but you do another. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. So again, there is, there is, a, there is a context in the, in the church um, as followers of Christ for us to, Apostle Paul writes in Galatians 6.1 about, Restoring gently those who've been caught in sin. There, there is, there is, con- there is a, a consequence to help people be restored gently, not harshly. So he doesn't say that's a bad thing to somehow keep people accountable. In fact, all of us should have some degree of accountability to someone uh, that helps us from making poor decisions. Um, but, but in this moment, he says, first, though, address the plank in your own eye. And I just so happen to have a plank this morning. True story, just for sake of honesty, the only time I ever go to Home Depot or Lowe's is to buy message props. <laughs> so <laughs> if you ever think less of me because of that, I'm okay with that. So, but that's a true story. Maybe I freed somebody up because you're not handy. Welcome to the club. We'll do a community group next semester. Um, people who call people who are handy, community group. That's what I do. I say I employ people who are handy. That's what I do. Um, so we have this plank in our eye. Last service, I almost, almost hit this camera, so I can't do that this time. I got lovingly corrected. So you had accountability. See? You got have accountability. Uh, so you have a plank in our own eye. It can be like this. We call out somebody for the way they spent their money, but we don't deal with the greed in our own heart. We call out somebody for their relational discretion, but we're in here not dealing with the lust in our own heart. We call out somebody else for maybe some apparent mistake or sin in their life, but we don't deal with the pride or self-righteousness in our own heart. You know, when we as followers of Christ walk around condemning the world in our culture, yet we walk around with large planks in our own eyes, we actually end up doing more harm than helping the cause of Christ. You actually, let me just free somebody up. You are not in the position. God has not called you to condemn the world. He came to save it. He's not called you to condemn your brother or sister in Christ. He's called you to deal with the plank that's sticking out your eye right now. So here's my question for you. What plank's in your eye? Let me just say it this way. A lot of times we think about sin and we think about behaviors. And sometimes... Years ago, the Lord spoke this to me, is that he's actually, was in his word, but he addressed this in me because sometimes we can think to ourselves, I'm good because I'm not doing certain things. But actually, God cares far more about motive than he does about behavior. 
That's why he said in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, you say do not commit adultery. I say don't have a lust in your heart. So you can judge someone who's acting on their lust, and God in heaven is saying, but what about your lust? You don't act on it, but it's there. You might judge someone for the way they spend their money, but in your heart, you have greed. And he's saying, I want to deal with that. Can I tell you when it comes to sin in our life, he doesn't want, just want to cut down the tree. He wants to pull out the root. Because if you leave that pride in there for too long, it'll, it'll bear fruit eventually. If you let lust stay dormant for too long, it'll bear fruit eventually. So he wants to deal with the heart of the matter. How do we do this practically? Lamentations 3.40 says, let us examine our ways and test them. Let us return to the Lord. There's an ancient Christian practice called self-examination. That basically is you with the Lord examine your heart. David wrote in the Psalms, search me, O God, and know me. Point out any wicked way in me. And you can examine your life. Here are even some questions you can process, like, God, search my heart. Are there any ungodly motives in my heart? Are there any destructive or, or habitual sins in my life? Am I being a godly spouse or parent? In my relationships, in my kind, do I speak words that build up people or tear down? In my work life, do I actually go to work to glorify Christ, or am I driven by selfish ambition? In my finances, do I actually view my finances as, as you have given me these to steward God, or do I view them as my own? Because that can affect, am I living a generous life like God called me to? You can do some self-examination. You can add that a few minutes into your regular devotional time. Just examine your heart. God, is there any sin in my heart, anything I need to repent of? You know, Jesus in Matthew 20, 23, 26, speaking to the Pharisees, he says, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will be clean. He says, address the heart of the matter. And one of the ways that we address the heart of the matter is, is through the practice of spiritual disciplines. Now, let me hear this. We don't practice spiritual disciplines to earn God's approval. Our spiritual disciplines is not us making ourselves more like Christ. It's setting the table for the Spirit of God to do a work in our heart. When we come to church and worship, we're not coming to church so we become a better person. We are coming to worship and sitting under the teaching of the Word of God so the Spirit of God can move in our heart. When we open the Scriptures, as I just said earlier, we open the Scriptures so we can meet with Christ and God can do a work in our heart. When we pray, we open the lines of communication so we can hear from God and that God can move in our heart. When we're in community group, when we're in relationship and we're confessing sin, being vulnerable with one another, we're doing so so God can work in our heart, even through our service. You know, the Bible says God, God exalts the humble, and he oppresses the proud. He comes against the proud. When we're in service, we invite Christ in to bring humility into our heart. Again, God is concerned about the heart of the matter. But what's done in the heart will eventually bear fruit. Luke 3, 8, John the Baptist says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Meaning, produce fruit as a follower of Jesus. Remember when I first married Christina, I went down to visit her, her dad. Um, now my father-in-law, great man. And uh, he was giving me a tour of their kind of property down in Florida. And they had a, they had a orange tree in their, in their yard. And he says, yeah, this is an orange tree. So when he showed me the orange tree, there were no oranges on it. But I, I made the assumption, he's an integrous man. He's honest. So I don't think he's lying to me. But how many of you know, if I would have went down there two or three more times and I never saw oranges, I'd be like, this guy is pulling a fast one on me, right? Like, this ain't no orange tree. He's trying to make me think, just because I'm from, uh, I'm from Maryland, like he's going to like have this orange tree and make me believe that, you know, we have orange trees everywhere in Florida, you know? But I went down the second time. The second time I ever went down there, there were oranges on the tree. Like, like he had, they had bags of oranges. They were giving them out to people because there were so many of them. Like if you are, if it's an orange tree, you expect to see oranges. And if you're a follower of Christ, we should expect to see the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5 speaks about the fruit of the Spirit. Um, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Here's my challenge for you this week. Maybe a part of your self-examination time. Uh, do a fruit check. Check your fruit. 
Check your fruit. You maybe even ask someone else in your life to check your fruit. Now, please hear this. This isn't, this isn't religious. We, we can't force the fruit. Again, we set the table for God to produce the fruit in us. So ask yourself, am I growing in my love of people? Am, 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 joy. Am, am I, do I have a joy that actually supersedes my circumstances? Or am I consistently discouraged? Do I find myself with the peace of God that's behind all understanding? Or am I constantly struggling with anxiety and worry? Patience. Am I becoming more patient? Or do I get frustrated when people take too long? Whew, anybody, that's me right there. I need that. I'm like, Lord, help me with patience. I am an impatient person. I need the Spirit of God. Kindness. Would others describe me as kind? Goodness, is the goodness of God evident in my life? Am I doing good deeds? Faithfulness, do I keep my word? Do I keep my promises? Gentleness, am I gentle with people? Or am I harsh and rough? Self-control, do I have self-control over my appetites? Not just your eating, but your spending and your activity. Do I have a self-control in my life? Bear the fruit of the Spirit. Here's the last point. So we have walk in freedom, bear the fruit. And lastly, it's, it's simple, but it's profound. That's love others. See, he, he, corrects, the, he corrects the judgment of the, the Pharisees because we are not called to be the judge of others. We are called to love others. James, brother of Jesus, said it this way in verse, chapter 4, verse 11. Brothers and sisters... On a side note, whenever you read the New Testament, if they say brothers or sisters, they're talking to church people. They're talking to followers of Christ, meaning it's kind of a family meeting. This isn't for the world. This is for if you're a follower of Christ because we're the family of God. Uh, if you grew up in a church context where, where you know, everybody was like brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so, this is where it comes from. It's actually biblical because that's what they used in the New Testament because that, that's the, we're the we're a spiritual family. We're not uh, it's just an organization. We're, we're family. He says, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but you're sitting in judgment of it. In other words, Jesus said it this way. When you judge others, you actually judge yourself as condemned. Because when you put yourself in the position of the, ju- of the judge... You actually are yourself bringing judgment upon yourself. He says, watch this. There's only one lawgiver, capital L, one judge, capital J, referring to God. One who's able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? You know, as a father, one of the the things that pains my heart is when my kids fight with each other. Like when they they put down each other because I'm like, Man, your brother and sister, you're like, you're simple. you should be for each other. Like, we need to support, we're family. This is what family does. We fight for each other, not with each other. But have you seen over the years that sometimes at church we can fight with each other instead of for each other? We put down each other. We point our fingers at each other. We slander each other. And James says, don't do that. You know why? Because the scripture is clear. There's a blessing where there's unity. And can I tell you, listen, God wants his church to be blessed. So we are not called to sit in the position of judge of one another. We are called to fight for each other. We are called to bless one another. Now, if someone is caught in sin, someone has areas of their life, especially if it's creating problems in the context of a local community of faith, Paul speaks to this. He says, says, brothers and sisters, again, mind you, family language. If someone's caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Here's a word picture. You know, we're in the middle of March Madness right now with basketball. Is that when a player gets injured, you'll often see coaches or players come around them and help them up. Like gently, right? Like if you may have tore a ligament, they're not going to like jerk you up, right? Come on. It's gentle. Why? They don't want to re-injure you. So the posture of the church when others have maybe have areas of sin in their life and they feel caught, they can't get out. We're not harsh with them. We're not beating you up. We're getting down there with you. And we're helping to restore you gently, gently, gently. It's so important because so often we can see harshness. We're called to be gentle. I love the words of Mother Teresa. She says, if you judge people, you have no time to love them. So good, Mother. It's good. First John 4, 
11 says this, dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. So Jeremy, if I'm not to judge people, what should I do? Called to love one another. That word love is the word agape. It's not the feelings of love. It's not the love that you see in your favorite rom-com. It's a, it's a sacrificial, daily decision type of love. That's what he's talking about. It's the love that Christ exemplified on a cross for you and for me. 1 John 4, 20, a few verses later, he says, if anyone says, I want you to catch this, I love God, but he hates his brother. Mind you the family language here. He is a liar. That's strong. Let me give him, if you love God, but you hate the church, you are a liar, John says. You're a liar. You can't, you can't hate another Christian and say you love God. Catch his reasoning. This is John. It's not me. Don't get mad at me. Don't get mad. He who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. This is the inspired word of God. That it is impossible for you to say, I love God, but I don't love the church. I don't love Christians. A lot of times we say that. I want to be sensitive. We say it because other Christians have hurt us. And, and here's what I would say as someone who I have been in that position many times. Is that you need to, you need to with God, allow the Holy Spirit to heal those wounds. You need to walk in forgiveness of that person. Sometimes, I've been there, you need to get some counseling. Talk through it with a good friend. Because we are called to love one another. You know, the church is called. I'm not talking about the organization church. I'm talking about the church, like the people. Because oftentimes, we aren't hurt by an organization. We are hurt by a person. But listen, like it, it, it is, the church is the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. Like, for myself personally, if you were like, hey, Jeremy, I love you, but I hate Christina, I'd be like, you don't love me then. In all honesty, if you know Christina, you like her better than me. I know that, okay? <laughs> I like her better than me. I mean, shoot. That's why I married her. You got to pray for her. She stuck with me, you know? She got the short end of that stick, you know what I'm saying? Like, you all know if you're married, you all know who made out. Come on. It's like, I outpunted my coverage on that one. Thank you, Jesus. This is an American joke. Let's move forward. Are you following me, though? We're called to love each other. What's that look like practically in the body of Christ, in the church, the local church, is we support each other. We pray for each other. We restore each other gently. We serve one another. We're generous with each other. We overlook the offenses of one another. That's what we're called to. The Apostle Paul in Romans 13, 8 says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. What law is that? To love your neighbor as yourself. We're called to love each other. The Bible's clear. We start with love in the family of God. The, the, Paul says, do good to everyone, especially to the household of faith. But we're also called to love the world. So what's that mean in your workplace? It means being kind, not getting caught up in a culture of gossip that slanders your boss speaking words of life. It means that coworker upsets you again with the Lord walking in forgiveness. It means being considerate of your physical neighbors, being considerate of people in your own home, that you're living out this posture of love. You know, practically next week, church, this is why I'm passionate about inviting you to be a part of this, because next week, we together as the church of Jesus Christ, expressed through Catalyst, get to love our community in a very practical way. We get to make a hygiene kit for somebody who's lacking basic hygiene essentials. We're making sandwiches for men and women who live on the street who that will take care of a lunch for that day. We're, 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 we're serving women and children who otherwise may not have the necessary resources with a newborn child. We are, we are blessing our community unconditionally, no strings attached. What's Paul say? Oh, no one anything except to love them. That's what I'm going to invite you to be a part of that. Even just an hour for the day. Be a part of Serve Day. Just to love our community together as a church. David Wilkerson, a late pastor, uh, he's since passed, but uh, he pastored in New York City. And he uh, says a great quote about love. He says that love is not 
something you feel, not only something you feel, but it's something you do. It's action. John 13, my last scripture, verse 34. Jesus says, a new command I give you. Love one another as I've loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's one of his parting words to his disciples. Love each other. This is how we'll be known. I want to I encourage you to grow in love. Ask the Holy Spirit to help me to grow in love for people. Even love those in your life who are unlovable. Come on, if you're with that person, look straight ahead, okay? But love those who are hard to love. Love those who've hurt you. Love your enemies, even Jesus says. Then the world we know, will know who we represent, whom we follow, Jesus Christ.